Now you all know that I've been teaching a different series of messages over the last uh, few weeks and on the subject of prosperity, and we're gonna get back to that after the holidays. But it is fitting today, because it is Easter Sunday, to take our focus of attention and put it on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the thing that we all need to uh, be reminded of and should, should know is that this is what sets Christianity apart from every other religion that ever was. And that is that no, there's nobody else, no other form of religion, no, no other followers of other religion can declare or say or have any evidence or proof that their leader was resurrected from the dead. Jesus is the only one who not only died for you, but was resurrected from the dead, that the power of sin might be broken in your life, that we might have eternal life and all the blessings that come with eternal life through his sacrifice on that cross. That's something to shout about and say amen. If I didn't preach another thing, that should be good enough for you to know and to have and to be happy with. But I'm going to preach some more because I'm a preacher and I was born to preach, so you're going to listen to me. Amen. I want you to open with me to the Gospel of John, chapter, we'll start at the very last verses of chapter 19 and move into chapter 20. But, you know, all the writers of the different Gospels all give their account of uh, what happened when they, you know, when they saw the, the tomb or when they, the, you know, the, their account of the resurrection. And the one thing that's interesting is that they all saw it from a different perspective and they all highlighted different parts of what they saw. But they all concur on this, these things. Number one, there was a tomb with a body of, of Jesus in that tomb. Number two, when they got to the tomb, the stone was rolled away. Number three, they spoke with angels, and angels spoke to them. Number four, um, when they saw the tomb and the rolled away, Jesus' body was not there, it was empty. And number five, they all reported having seen Jesus after his resurrection. So these are some of the outstanding points that, about the resurrection. But I want to take it from John's account, and I, I just like his account because I think it's a little bit more detailed and lengthy. So let's uh, start in chapter 19. We'll make some comments as we move along. But let's go to verse 30, uh, 38. So it says, um, After the death of Jesus, his body was taken down from the cross, and Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly. Well, uh, he was a secret disciple because, it tells us, because he was afraid of the Jews. Unfortunately, there still are secret disciples in the body of Christ. We're ashamed to declare our allegiance to Jesus Christ. We're ashamed to stand up and be counted as a Christian for fear of persecution. And let me tell you that the world is getting darker every moment of every day. And the darker the world gets, the less tolerant they are uh, towards religion and towards Christians and Christianity. And you can hear it on TV, you can hear it on the news, you can mention all kinds of religions, but when you start talking about Jesus Christ, how somehow, it's amazing to me about how the conversation just shuts down and gets turned around. Oh, don't mention that name because you might offend somebody. Well, I refuse to be a secret disciple. I refuse to hide in a closet. Every ungodly thing is coming out of the closet. It's time for you and I as Christians to come out of the closet and to be numbered with Jesus, to not be ashamed that we are a disciple of the living God, that we follow Jesus. So Joseph of Arimathea, although he was a disciple, he was secretly following Jesus. I don't want to be a secret agent. I want to come out up front and show forth my allegiance to Jesus Christ. Can I get a better amen than that? So it says, he asked, for the, he asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and he took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, he was another secret disciple. We have a lot of those. We still have them in the body of Christ also came bringing, now listen, this is important because we're going to talk about this, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. Myrrh and aloes were a sticky substance that they used in the burial process. And it says here, then they took the body of Jesus, and now listen, pay attention, and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews was to bury. Now, in that day, the Jews followed the customs of the Egyptians in their burial. Uh, procedure. So what they did is they would wrap the body mummy style. 
So they actually took, now pay attention, strips of linen, not sheets of linen, but strips of linen, dipped them in the aloe and the myrrh, and proceeded to wrap the body of Jesus with this linen. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day for the tomb was nearby. They had to get him buried to the Jewish custom, in, in line with the Jewish custom, because Passover was about to start, and they needed to get him buried before sundown. Let's go to chapter 20 now. Now, on the first day of the week, now the first day is not Monday, the day that we all go back to work, which you all think, oh, it's the first day of the week. No, Sunday is the first day of the week. And that's why we as Christians celebrate Sunday every single week. We gather together every week, or we should be gathering together every week. Because it was the first day of the week that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. So the early Christians proceeded from that first Sunday, continued the first day of every week to gather together to uh, celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And we continue to do that to this day, or should continue to do that to this day. So it says, it was the first day of the week, and Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. Notice Mary went to the tomb early. There's something phenomenal about this woman, Mary. This woman, Mary, had such a passion for Jesus that she was the first one to arise in the morning to go check the tomb to see what's going on. She went there to see what was happening. This Mary was so passionate for the things of God. She was so passionate, so in love with Jesus, so grateful for all that Jesus had done for her that she was the first one to get up and to run to the tomb to see what was happening. Do you realize that there was a, a, a Roman guard at that tomb? That there were angry Jews who were still irritated over all the stuff that Jesus had preached and the followers of Jesus. And yet Mary, in light of all of this, rose up early in the morning and ran to the tomb with such a passion in her heart because she was going to look for Jesus. Do you have that same passion in your heart? Because if you are a Christian and you are thankful and grateful for what Jesus has done for you, you should and we ought to have the same passion and love as Mary Magdalene had. See, no fear, nothing could hold her back from running to that tomb, even though there was an angry guard, even though there were angry Jews, even though there was all kinds of confusion. She, all by herself, this little woman, ran to the tomb because of her passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear God, we need that passion back in the body of Christ like never before. We get so waylaid with all, you know, our little lives and our little things that we forget, we forget we forget how important it is to keep that passion strong for Jesus. So here she went to the tomb while it was still dark, and she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, that's a curious thing because this was no little stone. This was a stone of massive size and massive weight that probably had to be moved by a I guess a, a, a group of, a huge group of very strong men. It's been told, and I have seen, I've read, that, that this stone could have weighed a ton or more than a ton in, in weight. So when they sealed this tomb, when that stone was rolled in front of that tomb, it had like a, it had like a channel in front of it, and it was on a slant, and that, that stone rolled down, and it locked in position. And then what they would do is they would take sealing wax or cement and put it around the edge of that stone, and then even sometimes tie it with ropes so that it would prevent looters or thieves from coming in and stealing from the dead people. So this stone that Mary saw that was rolled away could not have been rolled away by any natural men because nobody was there. There was a guard. There was an army standing there of Roman soldiers. There were angry Jews still around because they were afraid that someone would come and take the body of Jesus and proclaim that he had risen from the dead. It was written. It was written. You have to read your Bible. It was written. It was written. It's written in the Word of God in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, I'm sorry, 27, verse 62 through 66. It says, on the next day, this was after Jesus' death, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember. 
while he, that be Jesus, was still alive, how that deceiver, calling my Lord and Savior a deceiver, how deceived they were, said, after three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead, so that the last deception will be worse than the first. Then Pilate said, you have a guard. They had a battalion. They had an army. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. They were so afraid that, that someone was going to come get his body and proclaim that he was risen from the dead that they made sure that that stone was sealed as securely as it possibly could be. So much so that they put a guard, a Roman guard, in front of that tomb. Who gets a Roman guard watching a dead man's tomb? That's how much they feared what was going on through the life of Jesus. Hallelujah. So they went and they made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. So they just didn't roll the stone in front. They sealed it tightly. Mary gets up in the morning and she says the stone is rolled away and she looks in and she doesn't see Jesus. Let me just tell you something here. Do you know that Jesus didn't need the stone rolled away to come out of that tomb? That's right. Because in a little bit, we're going to see how he just walked through walls anyway. Because when in your resurrected body, you're not, you're not bound to, 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 the, to you know, anything in this earth. You just walk through things and you just, you're just there. You see, he didn't have to have the stone rolled away in order to come out. The stone was rolled away to prove to those who had come looking for him that he ain't there. That's right. He has changed the location. Come on, somebody give me an amen. So, so the stone was rolled away. Verse 2, then she ran. Well, let me, let me just say this because this is a curious thing. The stone was rolled away. This tells us something about the resurrection power that we talk about on this glorious Sunday. When, when the resurrection power came upon Jesus' body, he stood up and that stone just reacted and moved. You know what I learned and how that speaks to us today? That resurrection power will remove obstacles in your life. It removed the obstacle of the stone and it can and still and will remove any obstacle in your life as well. That's what it is when the resurrection power of God comes upon your life. It will remove every obstacle that would stand in your way. Amen. So he goes on, and it says, Then she ran uh, and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, that would be John, whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. She didn't know that he was to rise. She didn't get it yet. Therefore Peter went out and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple, that would be John, outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. So he just peeked in, and he saw the linen cloths lying there. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but rather folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, that would be John, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and he believed. We just read a few paragraphs before, a few sentences before, verses, that they wrapped him mummy style and they buried him in that tomb. What did John see that convinced him that Jesus had resurrected from the dead? Now, I grew up a, a Catholic in, in the Catholic Church, and I'm not disting the, the Catholic Church at all. They, they venerate and honor, and, and you know, I don't know if they counted a holy thing, but they've got this thing called the Shroud of Turin, which is believed to be the burial shroud of Jesus. Well, I submit to you, according to what we just read, there couldn't have been a burial shroud because he was wrapped in linen dipped in aloe and myrrh, mummy style. So when they looked in and they saw the linen, what, they, what says here, linen cloths, really it, what, what that 
renders out when you study it in the Greek is that they were still in their fold. They were still in the position and the place that they were last left. When John looked in and saw what he saw was an empty cocoon where a body once was that actually popped out when the, now here, when the resurrection power of God comes upon you, bondages are broken in your life. Nothing can hold you back. Nothing can hold you back because resurrection power and that same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. If you are a believer and a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, then resurrection power is alive in your life and has the power to break every kind of bondage that would ever try to bind you. Nothing could hold back the resurrection power that came upon Jesus' life. Isn't that powerful? So John looked in. He saw and he believed. And it says here, verse 9, For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Now listen, verse 10. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. Verse 11. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. The other the guys, I hate to say this, but the guys decided that we better get out of here because we don't know if anybody's going to come after us. But little Mary stood by the tomb. Let me tell you what, there was a passion that Mary had that we are lacking in the body of Christ today. There's a passion. We, we all ought to pray for the passion of Mary Magdalene to come upon our life because despite the army, despite the angry Jews, despite all the turmoil, despite, you know, the fear of her own life, she stood by that tomb looking for Jesus, hunting and panting after Jesus with her whole being. She wasn't going to leave that place until she found Jesus. Jesus, can I get a better amen than that? But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, the angels are talking to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord. No, she said, they've taken away my Lord. Not the Lord, but my Lord. Man, she had a personal relationship with Jesus. They took away my Lord. Hey, is he your Lord or is he somebody else's Lord? Is he, see, she's proclaiming that he is the Lord of my life. Is he the Lord of your life? Is he the Lord over everything in your life? Do you proclaim that this is my Lord? I don't know about you, but this is my Lord. He's my Lord because I'm in relationship with the living God. He's, my, he's Lord over my life. He's Lord over my future. He's Lord over my past. He's Lord over everything, over my money, over my everything. He's Lord over my life. She cried out and said, they've taken away my Lord. This is how personal it was to her, such a passionate little woman with such a hotness for God that she would not leave this site until she found Jesus. So she said, listen, she said, the two angels, and she said, woman, why are you weeping? She said, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Now, how could she not know this was Jesus? She walked with Jesus. She ate with Jesus. She sat with Jesus. She was around his presence, and just by, by her reaction to his death and being the only one at this point who's trying to find him, wherever he is, his body, whatever, she doesn't know. She doesn't fully understand that he was uh, raised from the dead. She was the only one hunting, and she did not recognize him. Well, when the resurrection power came upon Jesus, it changed him. He now has a resurrected body and he exemplifies the fullness of the, resurrected, of the resurrection power over our bodies. But for you and for me, when I received Jesus into my life, I don't know, I turned into somebody else resurrection power will change you. I don't think the same. I don't look the same. I don't act the same. I don't talk the same. I came across a friend some years ago, a high school friend, and he looked at me and he said, you know, I told him what I was doing and I was up here, you? And he listened to me for a little while. I said, I don't even know you. You're not the same person. Hallelujah. Glory be to God because resurrection power 
came upon my life and transformed me into somebody else. She did not, let me tell you what, people in the world, when you give your life to Jesus and you're living passionately, you're not living half-heartedly for Jesus, but you're passionate for God. You're passionate about the things of God. You've given your life to the Word of God. You've given your life to prayer and seeking God and putting God first, not second, but first. People aren't even going to recognize you. I started talking to that friend. I'm talking to the phone. He says, I, you don't even sound the same said hallelujah that's resurrection power that's gotten into my life and changed me into something that you you're never you, you'll never see that old man again because i am brand new in him i look new i talk new i act new i walk new come on somebody this is what this is what this is all about this is not just oh well you know god's up there and i'm down here this is about resurrection power coming upon people's lives that same power that raised christ from the dead dwells in you and dwells in me and it will change you it will change your circumstances it will shape you it will help you it will break every bondage in your life it will give you a brand new chance at life. This is what we're celebrating on this Easter. It's amazing to me how, how far people, how, I hate to use this word, but, well, let me, use it, let me say it this way because I don't want to offend anybody, how ill-informed people are about Jesus. They did a little segment on the news, and they were going around asking people about what Easter meant. People were like, oh, I don't know, second coming of Jesus? Um, something about somebody who came, had no idea what Easter was about. Now, we might laugh about that, but I'm going to tell you what, that is a really, really scary and very sad thing. The world is getting darker and more ugly, but yet we Christians, we who are here today celebrating the resurrection of our Lord, have the truth, have the word, have the reality, have the testimony of the resurrection power of Jesus changing us into something different than we were before. And we ought to proclaim it, and we ought to declare it, and we ought to let the world know unashamedly Amen of what Jesus has done for us. Come on, somebody in this house. I, I speak with Paul. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because it's life and power to me. Can I get a better amen? amen. So the angels ask her, why are you weeping? Now when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she didn't know it was him. Verse 15, Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? They're asking him again. She's crying, man. She's so in love with Jesus. Look at this. She's so in love. Let, let me just ask, are you so in love with Jesus that sometimes it brings tears to your eyes? I don't know about you, but I get, I get misty-eyed when I, I just think of the grace and the love and the forgiveness. I don't know. I don't know. I see so many cold-hearted Christians, so many Christians that are half-committed, and think it's okay. God wants all of you. Amen. Jesus died for you. Jesus hung and bled on a cross that you might be saved. Let's get passionate for God and get passionate for Jesus. This woman, Mary, stands out as such an unbelievable example of passion. So Jesus turns to her and says, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? He knew, but he asked her. She's supposing him to be the gardener. Didn't even recognize He's talking to her. Didn't recognize her voice. Supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have... Now listen, I love, I love... You, you missed this. You've read this a hundred times, but you all missed this. Sir, it, this is one of those verses, that if you don't really key in and pay attention, you don't understand the fullness of what is being said here. This is what this little lady says, this little petite lady, this little woman all by herself. She says to Jesus, she says, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Mary loved Jesus so much that she was willing to do whatever she had to do to attend to his body. True love will do whatever it takes. It will not hold back. It will not make excuses. 
It will not turn and run from a challenge. True love will say, I will do whatever. See, some of you can't even make a commitment to come to church every week. Mary was willing to drag the body of Jesus all by herself back to the tomb. What a demonstration of love and commitment. We need this demonstration of love and commitment in the body of Christ. Amen. Anything less, I believe, is cheating God. Happy Easter, everybody. <laughs> Listen, I got to preach it because that's what I'm called to do. I can't make you feel good because then you're just going to go out and be the same. How many of you want to stay the same? Don't you want to change? Don't you want to grow in God? Well, then we've got to speak the truth. Thank you for all my ameners. I appreciate you. The O knowers, we love you too. Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. True love thinks it can do more than it really can. Jesus said to her, Mary, called out her name. He, re he revealed himself to her. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, she's, now, she's hearing that, and she's making a beeline for Jesus. But Jesus had, had not yet ascended. The plan was not completed. He was not ready to be handled or touched by any human. He had to ascend back up to heaven. Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but rather go, my brethren, and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father and to my God and to your God. Hey, listen, 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 listen. I hate to tell you this, guys, but Mary had the honor of being the first one to preach the risen Savior. A woman was called to preach. There have been wars in churches fought over, well, can women teach in the church? Well, Jesus had no problem sending a woman telling him, you go tell those chickens because they're all hiding for fear of the Jews. You're the only one here. You go, girl, and you go tell them that I am alive. You go, girl. You go do it. And man, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Those, those, those suckers are hiding behind closed doors. But Mary's running around like a crazy person trying to find the body of Jesus, willing to drag him by her. Let me tell you what, this is hot for God. This woman is hot for God, hot for the passion. We need passion back in our lives, folks. You, you just can't go on day in and day out being a, a, a mediocre kind of Christian. There's got to be a passion that's ignited in your soul. And the way you get that passion back is you look to the cross. You look to Jesus. You look to his death. You look to his resurrection for you. And you're reminded of all that Jesus did in your behalf. I'm reminded every day that if it was not for Jesus in my life, I depend on him for every breath I take, for every step I take, for everything I do. Everything hinges on my connection to Jesus Christ. And I will live till I draw my last breath to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and proclaim my personal love for him. Come on, somebody give me a better amen than that. All right. Verse 18, Mary came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. She did it. The first, first evangelist was, was a woman. He had spoken these things to her. Now, verse 19, we're almost there. Then the same evening, or I'm saying, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear. Okay, now they're hiding behind closed doors, but notice they were assembled on a Sunday. It was the first. There's something about assembling on a Sunday. something about assembling on a Sunday. Well, well, they started from that time, kept on doing it. Paul even said, it says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Some are in the habit, 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 habit. He wasn't talking about a hat. He was talking about a bad habit. In the habit of doing. And more so as you see the day approaching. Let me tell you what, the day is coming. Jesus is coming back. He's got to come back soon because the world is so dark. All right. So the doors were shut 
the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them, didn't knock on a door, didn't ring a doorbell, didn't rap on the window, didn't call from outside and say, open the door. He just appeared in the midst of them. And notice what he said, peace with you. What does Jesus always bring? Peace. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and he showed him his side. And what he basically was doing, showing him the scars, the wounds. How many of you have wounds? You know what wounds are? They're the signs of victory. Some of them are physical wounds. Some of them are emotional wounds. Some you can see, but some you can't see, but you know they're there. But thank God for the wounds, because the wounds are a sign that I once hurt, but now I am healed. Come on, somebody, say amen. Those wounds are the sign of victory, and he showed them, and he still has those wounds, because they were the sign of victory. Death could not hold him back. Death could not keep him in that grave. He overcame death and the grave, and he has the wounds to prove it. Come on, somebody in this house, say amen. Verse 20, when, they, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. See, he brings, always brings peace. Jesus always brings peace. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And he's also sent you. And you, 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 to go be the passionate, bold disciples proclaiming his resurrection, proclaiming your personal testimony of what God has done in your life to bear witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Up to this point, the Holy Spirit wasn't released into the earth yet. Holy Spirit had a couple of appearances. We saw them in the Old Testament. But at this point, the Holy Spirit is released to start his ministry on the earth. And then it goes, verse 24. Now, this is, this is interesting. Now, Tom has called the twin. One of the 12 was not with them when Jesus came. He wasn't at the meeting. He wasn't at the service. Where was Thomas? Gee, maybe he was at a football practice. Maybe it was soccer. Maybe it was baseball. Maybe it was, be maybe it was tether, or whatever you call that thing, tether, soccer. I don't know. He was somewhere, but he wasn't at the service when Jesus appeared. That's why I say you better get to church, folks, because you're going to miss some of the most outstanding demonstrations of God's power and presence, and you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. We ought to be gathering more as the day approaches. Not less, but more. So you're all looking around the room like, I'm disinterested in what he's saying right now. I'm going to say it anyway. So Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, now, now there had to be a stir, it's like, oh, you're crazy, you mean you've seen the Lord? I don't. So this is what Thomas says, Thomas says, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Sounds like a lot of people I know. Prove it to me. Prove it. When I see it, I'll believe it. God doesn't operate that way, folks. That's just not the way the kingdom of God is set up. Thomas missed the meeting. He was not there. The disciples said, yep, he, he's there. He's there. there were, this, you know, I think the Bible's being really nice about this. Really, I think there must have been a real fight going on. Oh, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. You, you, what are you drinking? What do you mean he's alive? What are you smoking? He said, nope, he's alive. He came and he showed himself to us. Thomas says, unless I see it for myself, unless I see the nail prints in his hand, and his, I, I'm not going to believe, I don't believe, and he just walks away. And after eight days, his disciples were inside again. See, they're meeting, they're together, they're getting together. Inside, and Thomas this time was with him, because I think he walked away and said, maybe there's some, maybe they're telling, I better not miss any more church. Because <laughs> I don't want to miss him if he comes again. And Thomas was with them this time, and Jesus, uh, Jesus came, the doors being shut. In other words, he didn't knock on a door. He didn't ring a bell. He didn't rap. He didn't holler, let me in. He just walked through because he's in his glorified body. Now, you, you know, you and I are going to have glorified bodies one day. Hallelujah. I can't wait till my body is glorified because I'm getting tired of this body. As much as I'm trying to keep things up, it keeps falling down. Anybody know what I'm talking about? 
But one day we're going to have that glorified body. It's going to be perfect, man. It's going to be awesome. Hang in there. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Don't give up. Now take care of the one you got. Take care of the one you got. Fight against every bulge, every wrinkle, every flip, and every flop. But there's a time coming when your body's going to be glorified, just like Jesus' body. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So they were inside and Thomas was with them and Jesus came in with the doors being shut and stood in the midst of them and said, peace. Notice every time Jesus shows up, he just says, peace, peace. Jesus always brings peace. Doesn't bring turmoil, brings peace. And he said to Thomas, he just came to that meeting just to get Thomas. So I heard what you said. You don't believe? All right, watch big guy. You better watch out. Some of you say, oh, you better watch out. God will show up in your life in the most unusual ways to prove himself to you. So he said to Thomas, come here, Bubba. I don't know where I picked that up, but it sounds good. I think it's Southern, but come here, Thomas. Reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Whoa. Thomas is dumbfounded and he turns to the Lord and he says my Lord and my God wow gives me goosebumps when I think about it and Jesus turns to him and folks this is where you got to get excited Jesus said Thomas because you have seen me you have believed blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed That's you, that's me, that's us. Thomas and the 12 saw Jesus. They had the privilege of seeing him in his glorified body, in his glorified presence. We didn't get to see him that way. Jesus said, blessed are you because you've seen me, but more blessed, supremely blessed, overwhelmingly blessed are those who have not seen me, but yet believe and hold faith until that day that they see me face to face. That's you, that's me, that's us. More blessing, that's a blessing that was given by Jesus on that day that would fall upon every human who would believe in him and put their faith and trust in him for their eternal salvation. He said, blessed, supremely blessed, overwhelmingly blessed are those who have not seen me but yet believe. That is the most unbelievable truth that you need to think about and chew on for a while, that we're blessed. I don't know about you, but I'm blessed. For having Jesus in my life, I'm blessed. My life has been turned around. Yeah, sometimes your faith is tested and sometimes doubt wants to come in and unbelief wants to come in and sometimes you get impatient and sometimes things don't go right in life and sometimes life deals you a couple of lousy blows but let me tell you what Jesus has overcome all of it if you just hold to your faith if you just hold to your trust if you just hold to your belief in Jesus Christ that blessing of the Lord will manifest itself in all kinds of powerful ways Blessed are you, Thomas, because you have seen me and believed, but more blessed, supremely blessed, overwhelmingly blessed are those who have not seen me, but yet believe. That's you and me. I don't know about you, but I feel really blessed. Amen. To know the Lord, to have him in my life. I live every day just awestruck over what God has done in my life. Take no credit for anything. This has been the blessing of God. Why? Because of my faith in him, my trust in him. I trust him with my whole life. I trust him for my every breath. I trust him for everything. Because that resurrection power that we talk about today, that raised Christ from the dead, also quickens. I've got that verse right here. Can I give you that verse and then we'll go home, all right? We'll go home and we'll have our lamb or our turkey or our ham and we'll do the Easter egg hunt. But let me tell you something, it's not about turkey, ham or roast beef or any other kind of thing. It's not about Easter eggs, the Easter bunny. 
Someone asked me if the Easter Bunny was to my house. A friend of mine said, Easter Bunny, could I? I said, I know some kind of bunny's in my house because I see it all over my yard. <laughs> it's not about Easter eggs and Easter Bunny. It's about Jesus Christ, the resurrected <laughs> Son of God who lives forever and reigns. And it says, listen, this will be our last verse, and then we'll, we'll shut it down. Romans 8, 11, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life, everybody say life, life. to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That's the resurrection power of the living. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord a hand clap. Or Let's stand together, if you will. Hallelujah. Glory to the name of Jesus.